Okay, so um, one thing, as I was just mentioning to a few of our others, if you can fill in the survey, you should receive a survey, Google Form survey by email, where I'm just kind of trying to get a sense of where everyone is with um, being able to set up a MariaDB server, because obviously that's needed for the practical. So the aim is if you've, everyone's filled that in, I mean, it take, takes three seconds, but I'm going to collate that tomorrow and then we'll do remedial things for those who haven't been able to get it done. But if you can get it done, please do. Um, I think what's going on is if you set up AWS without a credit card number, then it doesn't let you in. I thought AWS Educate was going to let you in for that, but I haven't had a reply from them uh, confirming that. So I'm still waiting on that reply. And I thought in the meantime, we'll work out some backup options. Okay, so today, we're gonna sort of talk about like a step towards the solution for some of the challenges and the landscape of challenges we've been sort of sharing in previous lectures. So I'm gonna introduce you to a data science process. So the thing we've been constantly emphasizing so far is you must not forget the context of the data. And actually what's weird in computer science and software engineering I mean, there's so many things in place, separation of concerns to make you forget that context. But because this is a new thing and the data is so pervasive in that way, um, we really have to be careful about um, forgetting that context. So I was just checking, we're getting sound. Um, so I introduced three challenges last time, the paradoxes of data society, this sort of fact that we're collecting more and more data and it doesn't um, seem to improve our understanding of society. Quantifying the value of data, that's the fact that we uh, are trying to uh, encourage good behavior in data, those opening game moves that I spoke about, like how do you know how to reward the first move, opening moves of the game? And, and that's where all the value comes from data, people sort of setting up data in a way that others can reuse it, but actually rewarding people for doing that turns out to be quite hard. And we've got real problems with that, which is why so much data is so poor quality. And then this aspect of privacy, loss of control and marginalization. So, so much of what we're doing with data works on aggregate data. That might be because um, we're doing classical statistics and we've got some randomized sample and then we can only look at averages or because we're looking at machine learning where we're looking at um, objective functions which we're tending to maximize on average. And this has an effect of marginalizing those who are minorities or the vulnerable or who don't have digital accessibility. And the thing that I want you to remember is that the way around this, or one of the ways around this is to try and always place people at the heart. Where data scientists are right now, you have some tremendous power. So remembering all those things becomes very important. So this also leads into challenges which are related, not so much the focus of today, but challenges in deploying artificial intelligence. Because when people talk about AI systems as deployed today, what they really mean is that they've got a set of deployed machine learning components. And those machine learning components themselves will often be built by data scientists or learning from data that data science purified. So everything, when it says, oh, we, we're using our big AI system. So let's, I would say that Amazon's buying system is arguably the world's largest AI system in terms of automated purchases it makes per week, the scale of it, but it's mostly driven by machine learning components or even operations research components, which are based on data, which are built by data scientists or equivalent or the data pipelines thereof. So it sort of really is affecting, you know, the same thing would be true of um, the, say, uh, Facebook's uh, systems. And this aspect of, um, it's, there's an internet of people, it's not an internet of, um, uh, things. So, and particularly now what we're seeing, so at one point this was being called fog computing, which I thought was quite funny, but now it's been talking about computing on the edge. So people like Nick Lane, who's in the department, they're very interested in what it means as you start deploying these methods down to hardware. But of course, as we're deploying them down to hardware, that's causing more and more data to come back to software. Okay. So, it's a major new challenge to deploy such systems. Um, and actually the other problem that we have is the systems we're deploying are extremely fragile. 
So what happens when you deploy them in practice is that they encounter unforeseen consequences that weren't considered by the data scientist uh, when they built the system and then they break. And when they break, they break bad. So you're, that's a component we've not really talked about so far. This is the interaction between um, machine learning and sort of large scale computer systems, uh, service oriented architectures. And I'm not gonna talk about it too much today because I really wanna sort of focus on the piece that um, you're gonna mainly be doing for your project. But once again, I just want you to know the context of why this all becomes so important because the data-driven decision-making is becoming a sort of linchpin in this whole edifice, right? And it's being done really badly. So that's kind of very worrying. So what I'm gonna to introduce today is, is what I call the finesse framework, which is a finesse framework for the, um, I'm going to suggest you use and you could also use say if you're doing a data science project and it's got three aspects to it which is um, access assess and address and these three aspects are I call them aspects not stages purposefully they are sort of ordered as we'll find out access is like when you start getting the data into the system assess is what you were doing last lab so access is like lab one roughly assess is like lab two and you're gonna start address in practical three, yeah? So roughly they line up with the practicals and you'll see in the assignment, access is roughly question one, assess is roughly question two and address is roughly question three. So I'm really sort of trying to drill this in. So there is, it feels like there's some ordering but I'm purposely not calling them stages because what I think when you think of them as stages, it's sort of like, well, today I'm going to do access and tomorrow I'm going to do assess. No, they tend to sort of muddle together when you're actually doing any data science problem. And the whole point in the structure I'm about to give you is to remind you to try and tease them apart because the fact that they muddle together means that these stages are often compressed in one piece of software. And that means it's very difficult to disentangle and reuse across a wider ecosystem. And also means it's more likely that there are bugs and testing's harder, everything else. Oh. So just to put this in context, I'm gonna first also introduce the CRISP-DM uh, framework for data mining, which in CRISP stands for Cross Industry Standard Process or something, and DM stands for data mining. So this is a data mining process that was created in um, the year 2000, and you'll see it being mentioned when people talk about data science. Um, I think it's got some good aspects, but I think it, and it really covers a lot of the things that we were talking about. But the, th the sense that this is happening, that's, I don't know, somehow people are pushing these things between different people is, um, is not the way it's working at the moment. A lot of this is just being collapsed into your head. I mean, so maybe like the, you, might, you might not have to worry too much about deployment, um, for example, but you are gonna have to worry about each of these interfaces. So this is a sort of long-standing framework. I have never seen anyone talk about it within Amazon, but I see people talk about it within academia quite a lot. Um, so it's sort of worth mentioning. What I like about it is it has these aspects to it, like the, the data preparation and the modeling, it, it acknowledges that there's some iteration between them. The business understanding and the data understanding it acknowledges some preparation between them. And then there's these, I mean, there's lots of loops, right? <laughs> I'm not quite sure, you know, at which point you start, um, stop operating loops. I'm not, for example, sure that data understanding leads to data preparation and doesn't lead to data understanding. For me, there's like loops everywhere, right? This is so connected at the moment uh, because the, the business understanding, right? And then there's this, this clear, there should be a connection somehow between deployment and business understanding as well. And this is why I'm kind of loading you with all this, oh, kind of, you sort of need to know everything at the moment because of the pervasiveness of what's going on. But I think it's sort of a useful starting point as a framework. But <laughs> what I want to emphasize is it, it's a framework for data mining. And this is the Google Trends, which, you know, I like using data to analyze data science. And so this, that, that's published in 2005. So this is 2004. Now, what's interesting is you see the search term data mining going down. But conversely, you see data science going up. Now we know this is all, as we've already said, this is just to do with what the technologies are and the perceptions of things are. I think that the um, particular thing going on with data mining is as a field, it was 
I think it was dominated by people who were working quite closely with database systems. And so that was quite powerful because it meant so sort of 20 years ago, those were the insights that you could derive quickly because they were sort of insights that you could always, I always think the sort of data mining algorithms are, I mean, some of them are really, really cool and really fast, but a lot of them are of the form, oh, I can fit that in a SQL query. Yeah, quite a short SQL query. So, and that sort of makes sense because back in sort of 20 years ago, that was the, somehow the limit of our ability perhaps to compute on the type of data sets people cared about. So my sense is that why does data science emerge today? Well, data mining never really made use of machine learning. I mean, it's sort of interesting what strong separation there was between the data mining and the machine learning field. I think that they've come, the people who are in those fields are much closer together today and, and working under this umbrella of data science. So you sort of see the terms faded somewhat. Um, I mean, this is, this is my personal opinion. Someone who worked in data mining might have a different opinion, but they certainly weren't using, like back here, we were still using lots of machine learning algorithms. I mean, this is like the takeoff time for this is ImageNet with um, convolutional neural networks is 2012, but right across here, there was lots of machine learning, Gaussian process support vector machines, whatever people doing stuff. And then the sort of neural networks are coming in here, right? So it's this sort of emergent phenomenon that we've already talked about before. So even if we like the CRISPR -D CRISP DM process, it seems like worth revisiting that. And I would say the really emergent thing that has also happened since then. So look, actually AWS um, launches here, 2006. Yes, there's, so there's another big change in structure that happens around the software systems, which are so important to how we're deploying. And AWS is launching as sort of um, software, so service-oriented software, or software as a service, service-oriented architecture, software service-oriented, but the ultimate yes, service-oriented architecture or software as a service, and the whole of like so Amazon around this point here, and this is actually a really interesting thing. I was thinking I've got to do some government advice at the at the moment, and I'm trying to think of like sensible things you can help explain. Most companies' software actually reflects, like tech companies, reflects their organizational structure to some point, and like in terms of their people management structure, because you end up with different teams and departments, in inverted commas, owning software. And Amazon itself reorganized at this point to do sort of services, or some people would call that microservices. And really, that's the dominant paradigm you see people are deploying today. So that, that framework's described back here. And the paradigm of software then was still a monolithic software paradigm, like Amazon's web server was still one large piece of executable code that was a bit of a nightmare to run. But by 2006, that, that paradigm's changed quite a lot. And I think a lot of the way that a modern data scientist ends up working is you're interacting with that software paradigm. A lot of the things you're dealing with are a consequence of the software paradigm that's used. Um, I really like this. This is from Kathy O'Neill and Rachel Strupp, which is a book called Doing Data Science, which I think if you're interested in some of this stuff is a great sort of book to read. So more generally, a data scientist is someone who knows how to extract meaning from and interpret data, which requires both tools and methods from statistics and machine learning. And I love this little sub sentence, as well as being human. <laughs> She spends a lot of the time in the process of collecting, cleaning, and managing and munging data because data is never clean. This process requires persistence, statistics, and software engineering skills, skills that are also necessary for understanding biases in the data and for debugging logging output from code. I mean, it's very in line with everything I've been saying so far, right? And I think that that's quite a nice book that describes. Cathy uh, O'Neill is also, she wrote that book, Weapons of Math Destruction, which I haven't read so I can't comment on that and this is their um their equivalent I guess of, of crisp but you sort of see again you've got these sort of uh, raw data is collected data is processed clean data exploratory data, data analysis machine um, and going back to raw data is collected that 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 cycle is really important you'll see that coming up a lot we're going to go through some case studies so you, you can sort of see how these things project onto the case studies Machine learning algorithms, statistical models, communicate visualizations, oh, so important, so important, right? To communicate 
with the decision maker visualizations, we're not going to do as much on that as, as we could because we're not expert on visualizations. That's a field in itself. Report findings, build data product, go back to the real world. So it's got another, another more of these loops in it. And I think this is, I really quite like the way they're laying things out here. I would say that the, the reason I'm not saying, okay, do this, right, is because in some sense, this is what's going on in the organization, right? And you as a data scientist are a small part of that organization. And there's no way you can keep all of these things in your mind, like when you're doing your activities. So the, the framework I'm gonna teach you is more about how you and your local team members might be working together rather than what the overall process of data science is. But I really like this. I think that's a sort of more modern thing of the CRISP DM. So in, in practice, in the real world, this, there's this ongoing thing, and we used to have, I may have mentioned it already in, in these lectures, but this is, this is right at the heart of what I think is going on when you've got a data-driven process within your company. This cycle of experiment, analyze, design. So doing an experiment, which means acquiring data, analyzing the experiment, designing a new experiment, and going round and round. That happens at every level. That's gonna be happening in your data science analysis that you're doing, like to answer the questions you have about, oh, that's funny, why is that column appearing like this? You know, within your sort of debugging, data science debugging type process. But it's also happening at a macro scale within whatever organization you're interested in, right? So one of the problems a lot of organizations face is they're not flexible enough to sort of do the experiments they need to understand their system better. Because if you're not doing this, you don't really understand your systems and actually, Modifying the systems once they're designed is really, really hard as well. So that's the sort of problem you get like at scale in an organization like Amazon, where your entire supply chain is coded in thousands of lines of code. So how, you, how do you do, do innovation on that, that, that type of framework is what the sort of larger entity around you is doing. But this is something that we came up with uh, in my team at Amazon um, to try and explain why, what everything that my team was doing. So it's, it's stolen from... Uh, like this Bezos quote, which I quite like, which is, he says, I think he says 10 years, maybe we should say 10 years. He says, we don't know what the world's gonna look like. I don't know what the world's gonna look like in 10 years time. I think he has this approach of saying, but it's, it's quite easy to say some things it won't look like. And his whole thing is around selling. So he says, well, people won't wanna pay more for stuff. They won't wanna wait longer for stuff and they won't want a smaller diversity of selection for stuff. So. Therefore, the company prioritizes reducing delivery times, reducing costs, and increasing diversity of selection. And because you can say, well, whatever the world looks like, that's what it's gonna want. So stealing that, you can think about that in terms of your data science systems. So you won't know what science or data science will want in five years time, but we won't want slower experiments. We won't want more expensive experiments and we won't want a narrow selection of experiments. And a lot of the problems we have at the moment with data science ecosystems is you've got an ecosystem that really slows down the experimentation because the data isn't clean, the provenance of the data is hard to work out, et cetera, et cetera. So companies are going to become more quantitative and more data driven, right? I think would be a general sort of rule. So improving the quality of these systems is going to be like a major priority in the same way that improving the quality of software engineering was. So faster, cheaper, more diverse experiment, experimental capability, I should say probably for this audience, better ecosystems for experimentation. This is something my team works on data-oriented architectures. So this is a research area under Auto AI that we are writing about where you go beyond service-oriented architectures and you say, well, in service-oriented architectures, you stand up a service and that's necessary, but not sufficient for data-oriented architecture. In a data-oriented architecture, you stand up a data stream. So your, your software team is not just responsible for the quality and availability of the service, it's responsible for the quality and the availability of the data stream, which tends not to be incorporated in current software engineering techniques. And you need new, you need new socialization of that idea and you need new technologies to make that easier to do. So that's like a big area that my team works on. Another, um, Another thing we haven't spoken about so far, data maturity assessment. So this is like when I do exec ed, I'm always saying, oh, this is the first thing you should do. Work out how easy it is for people in your company to access each other's data. So a data maturity assessment is really an access assessment. It says, well, go around the company and ask people, how easy is it for you to get the data you need to do your job? 
And then how easy is it for you to get data from people in your team? And how easy is it for you to get data from people outside your team? And basically at some point you'll find, well, that will require an email, you know, the, and then at some point it's like, well, could we get rid of that? Because you really don't want a system where in order to get the data, people are emailing and visiting each other, but that's very often the case. So that data maturity assessments is, is a way of uh, grading companies according to how, how good they are. There's something we introduced in the tech survey at Amazon across the whole organization. Uh, and data readiness levels we already discussed last time, trying to assess the quality of data. So that's assessing the quality of the cooperation, that's assessing the quality of all government or hospital or whatever, the quality of um, the data. Okay, so um, there's a video there that you can watch, which is about, which is a talk I gave at the Alan Turing Institute, which is, was about what it was like trying to do um, data-driven decision-making in the early pandemic. Um, so policy con science and convening power of data. If you wanna watch that, that'll give you some more details of how these things are panning out in, uh, when you're trying to do rapid government advice. Okay, so just to sort of say a little bit about the service-oriented architecture. So the, gnosis, the, the notion in service-oriented architecture is I'll have a bit of code, which will have a number of REST APIs. They're all sitting inside. So the thing I control if I run this service, this cost allocation service. So the idea here is it's a ride-sharing service. So someone's got, there's a ride request coming in. We collect data from available riders and available drivers. We allocate a driver, we update the data sending back out to, uh, these are other services, who's available to drive and who's available to ride. And then we make an allocation, which will probably be returning to this service here, which is a separate service. So that's a very typical setup. And a software team in Amazon, a team of about six to eight people would own something like that. They don't do driver allocation, but uh, if they did, and uh, you know, I think uh, Uber was similarly structured. So you'd have a software team that owns this as a service. So they, they, they make call outs to other services and there are incoming services that um, make calls to them. And then they are responding to the sort of data ecosystem. So that's service oriented architecture. The difference in notion in, in the data oriented architecture is you actually have a, a pretty much a stateless service. So the notion is, so it's a bit like functional programming versus other forms of programming. Our notion is that, um, your driver allocation service is, is visible, but so are all these joins that are going on outside. So the ride request is coming in, but there's a join occurring in the ecosystem. So not within your service. You don't own that join. In this case, these joins are being done inside your data, and these are REST API calls. In this case, this is already possible. These joins would be done in perhaps potentially like a streaming ecosystem. If people heard of Kafka or Kinesis, these are sort of on-demand streaming ecosystems that tend to be the way people are building real-time um, uh, like ad click through systems today. I think uh, did Kafka come out of, who did Kafka come out of? It's Confluent was a spin-off. I think it was a spin-off from Twitter at some point, but I may have got that wrong. But the whole notion here is that these joins are occurring in that ecosystem. So that's part of the wider service that Kafka. So Kafka does a nice job because if you're doing normal service oriented architecture, you have to um, look after persistence in your software, right? So the persistence of this service is your responsibility. So you might be constantly dumping to S3 if you're on AWS, some state of your service, so that if your service goes down, you can recover the state and continue to operate, right? So everything's robust to failure within these service-oriented architectures. Now in, um, in a data-oriented architecture, that's all handled for you by the ecosystem. So what happens in those streaming systems is everything's instead of pull, uh, it's all push compute. So you get incoming data that gives you an update on the available riders, the available drivers and the uh, ride requests. And that forces you to compute a driver allocation rather than someone calling you to compute a driver allocation. And then the notion is that because this basically this graph of connections is part of the ecosystem. So the ecosystem handles persistence for you, right? So the way that Kafka and Kinesis do that is they snapshot themselves. And by snapshotting themselves, they allow for recovery. But then that leads to all sorts of advantages if we want to inspect this ecosystem to see what's attached to what. Because what you can see here is 
Now we know what the inputs to the subservice were. And we can see where the outputs are coming. They're on the ecosystem. They're not buried in the service. So that's like a core idea of data-oriented architectures, because now you can start to model the quality of what these things should be. Just to give you a quick sense of, um, yeah, and I'll just skip through that for time. So these ideas are coming from a number of different areas. That's kind of where I think software ecosystems are going in order to solve some of the problems we've talked about. Um, so that's where some of these systems are going. Um, they're not there yet. And the fact that they're not there yet gives us a load of headaches. Because if they were there, then you would have a data ecosystem where you could extract the data and you would kind of know its provenance because you could trace through where it had come in the ecosystem. As long as it had entered clean, or you could talk to the, the group that was operating the ecosystem where the, where the data was becoming dirty. And you could automatically monitor that. You could do this thing called progression testing. You could deploy tests to make sure everything's coming through as expected. At the moment in service-oriented architects, you have no idea about any of that. So that's a big interest within the research group. But the inspiration for the framework, so what does it mean for you? So the work you're going to do, and this is all coming from initially work with Data Science Africa, then sort of work in Amazon, particularly in the supply chain, and then the Royal Society Delve Group. So I, I kind of, this is a sort of accumulation of what I think is, what I should have said when I first arrived, say at Amazon or wherever else. So the, the motivation for these problems is that I mean, there's a, and this is a talk here again, you don't have to watch it, but if you can watch it, if you're interested, this complexity of what everything you're pulling together in this service-oriented architecture is leading to this problem that uh, this guy, Jonathan Zittrain, so I knew this problem existed, I didn't have a name for it. And then I found this name, this guy, Jonathan Zittrain, who's at Harvard, calls it intellectual debt, that you end up deploying large numbers of components in your software ecosystem, right? Um, you understand each component, but you don't understand the system as a whole. So there's something called technical debt, which is I deploy a, a structure quickly in an effort to get things working. And then I find that's very hard to maintain. So technical debt is the way I deploy, I don't think enough about my engineering, and then I incur technical debt and the maintenance. Intellectual debt, fine, maybe you're on top of your maintenance, but you, you deploy all these components that are interacting, and you can't understand how they're interacting. And my favorite example of intellectual debt would be Mark Zuckerberg, sort of the day after the US election, saying the idea that um, we affected the election in any way is, I can't, is crazy. It's a crazy idea, he said. And eight months later, they reported to Congress on all the ways that Facebook had um, spread news that was originating from the Internet Research Agency to the number of Americans that saw it, which is something like 80 million to fake news that was generated from a place with like 100 people working on it. And it's not because it was a conspiracy. It's just they don't understand their own systems and how people could exploit them. This also happens with search engine optimization, many, many things, right? It's quite hard to manage these complex systems. So into the finesse framework, I mean, because that's like, that's the big picture. And actually, we go right down to what you're doing in any given moment. I think to help solve this problem, these are the three aspects that you need to be thinking about when you're doing data science. because. There are three key parts to this sort of role when you're addressing this debugging question. So this is the attempt to go right to that debugging thing and say, well, what three parts are that? And the reason we're trying to separate these is because that separation should prove useful later when your insights go back into the wider ecosystem where we've got all these challenges. So the three aspects are access, and that's the whole process that you're going through before the data is available electronically. We'll talk about what that involves in a minute, but there's things that are clearly not even software engineering, like legal rights, the ethical use of this data, et cetera, et cetera. Assess, and this is all the work that can be done on that data without considering the specific question. So often there's lots of work you could do, which are things you can do without knowing what question you're going to answer. Like, so, even defining the schema is kind of at the interface of access and assess, right? It's an interesting one, it's on the borderline. So you can see this, this doesn't become clean because defining the schema is something you have to do to access the data, but it's also something you're doing to sort of tidy up the data and you actually have to start looking at the data a bit before you define the, the database schema. Um, but other things that it might involve is, what are the, just characterizing are the missing values in this data and how are they being represented? 
what are the values of the columns? That's part of the schema ca ca calculation. Is, it, is that categorical? Um, you know, are there any sort of issues with outliers in this data? How was it collected and what type of outliers might we have? There's all sorts of things. And then address is, okay, I've got this question. I need to do this UK price paid thing. These are the things I, I do that are specific to that question. And the reason we're taking that out is because assess should be reusable, right? So the temptation, so people will say, oh, you do data wrangling and then you do data modeling. That would be the other simple view of data science. And that's kind of true. And that's something that's gonna be happening. But the problem is that in each of these stages, you might be doing some data wrangling and some data modeling as sub stages. And that's all nice, but which is the reusable part of that? All of this is totally reusable for other questions up to address, right? So all the work you're doing up to address is reusable. And what's going on at the moment is people are forgetting that and they're, they're sort of integrating the access, assess and address into one analysis, which means that someone later who comes along wants to use the same data isn't able to benefit from the access and the assess, yeah? See what I'm doing with the S's here and finesse and everything. Took ages to think that up. So, so access, that sort of first stage, and that was sort of lab one. You know, I try to encourage you to look at the licenses you were seeing as you start opening those things. It shows you what the license is. Every time you're downloading the data, there's legal work you need to do to understand if you are allowed to use it, what uh, you're allowed to use that data for what you'd like to. There's different licenses around this stuff. So some people say this is fine for academic use, but not for commercial. Very easy for you to integrate a data set into a commercial product that is available online, but says specifically this is for non-commercial use. Indeed, some of those data sets, I think that you were downloading, say specifically this is for research use or teaching use only. So legal, that's actually, legally you are not allowed to do these things. Or infringing on the GDPR, if you're going to be collecting data from someone's mobile phones. Intellectual property, and personal data rights. Those are the two forms of rights that you're often infringing when you look at data and you need to be careful to check what those, how, how those are manifesting in this case. But strong separation between legal and ethical, people conflate these. So that's the difference between legal and ethical is legal is what the law says, ethical is what you think you should do. And th this separation is particularly important in data science because the law is behind what our capabilities are in data science. So you can make ethically dubious decisions that are perfectly legal, yeah? But you wanna think about that. Now, if you're doing medical data, there will also be things like ethical, uh, you'll have to go through ethical approval as well. Extraction of data, sorry, that should say from instead of form where it's held. So this comes up so many, we're gonna see an example with some logbooks, but some, what if the data is on people's mobile phones, right, already? you know, and you need to get it off before you can analyze it. Or my favorite example from Data Science Africa says, well, I know how to, I know how to acquire, he was a guy working on cows and what their movements were. And he says, well, I know how to put the sensor on the cow and I know how to do the data analysis at the far end, but how does the data go from the cow to the analysis at the far end? Yeah, that's actually where all the work is. You know, everyone's teaching the, the first and the latter thing, but it's far more work to build a data ecosystem that can collate I mean, we've got this, you see all these uh, screens around giving you the Cambridge um, data on buses and all that sort of stuff. Imagine how much work is going there to collate that data. So sometimes that comes up. It could be that the data is written on physical log books, or it could be written that the data is in a software ecosystem like the one I just described with service oriented architectures and it's undeclared and you have to go to every team saying what data are you using and that's really common so I had a part two project last year where we were working with an F1 team and it was very cool because the F1 team just gave the student their API for what the project was about and so that the student then had to go through the API finding out where all the data was being written you know and, and pick out the data from the API so that's all I would say access stuff and this is all associated with the data readiness level C that we spoke about earlier. So quick case study, this is from the um, uh, guy on the uh, left there is Jimmy and the guy on the right is Mike. And this was crash map Kampala. So um, Mike uh, was, uh, this is a picture of Kampala and he was cycling to the university there and the traffic is interesting in Kampala. And he was wondering, 
I wonder what's the, large, what's the largest killer of say young um, people in Africa? Uh, is it road accidents? Actually, people have done more work on this since then. I think the answer is basically yes. But in order to try and find that out, he wanted some data. And Jimmy happened to be a master's student at uh, Makere University, but also happened to be in the Kampala police. So they started working together to take logbooks that were recorded in every police station, what the form of accidents were, in order to try and assess what the level of uh, sort of death and serious injury is for car accidents within Kampala. So what number one thing would we now be thinking of is gonna be an access thing that's gonna come up? What was gonna make us nervous now? Go ahead. Legal, Legal. yeah. Legal and, and even if, it, we, I don't know what the law is in, is in Kampala around um, GDPR, personal data rights, but there's gonna be laws around those people and you know the information that you have in those logbooks. Right, so obviously having Jimmy along for this ride and getting the, aligned with the Kampala police was key. This doesn't work without Jimmy, right? If, he, if it's Mike trying this on his own, this, this just doesn't happen. Um, but even if the laws weren't in place, there would be ethical queries around whether you should be surfacing this data. And if you're working with a police force, there's gonna be ethical queries often about what are they gonna use that data for? What's the nature of this police force? You know, uh, what, how much can you trust? There's another really interesting one. They got to the stage with this, where the police are like, brilliant, let's throw away the logbooks. We don't have to do this. We can use this mobile phone app you've created. No, 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 don't be doing that. Because the one thing we know is that the logbooks have existed for 50, 60 years and have got 60 years worth of data. And we have no evidence that um, there's the technical capacity to maintain electronically recorded data within the Kampala police force for the next 60 years. So that would, you know, all sorts of interesting things come up, right? So they, they had these scans, they, they took photos of the books and then they separated the photos up into, um, into parts where, so this was, uh, I, got, I got Mike to fire this back up on AWS for me and they crowdsourced um, the location. So here, they, there were columns in these books and there was this sort of stage of sort of trying to just identify the columns with the information fuzzed out. And then once they got that, then they just gave people individual bits of information and asked them to uh, read them. So it's sort of so interesting here because this is, says, I think it says Batan Ba in Tebe Road. So in Tebe is where the airport is. It's down uh, to the uh, Southwest of there. So I don't know where in Tebe Road is, but the idea is if you do know, and, and sometimes it's just going to be like some colloquial description of where the crash happened that the policeman would be aware of. So actually, I, when I was doing crowdsourcing of this, um, so this is actually in Bantaba and Tebe Road is the uh, transliteration. And then it gives you the option, if you do know where that is, please indicate. But if you don't, just give us the text. So the, the software that Mike had to write for doing this, there's so much bespoke software in terms of crowdsourcing this. So there was another one recently where people were crowdsourcing temperature. People see that, asking people to do, I played with that a bit. Uh, from old temperature logbooks. So the date of collision, you've got the same thing and you've got to put the date in and um, the severity of the collision. So they're giving some options and that one obviously says minor. Uh, oh, look, here's a report. You think it might contain private information, yeah? Because it's really hard to guarantee that someone hasn't written something private right across that bit. In, in Amazon, for example, there's detectors everywhere trying to detect accidental ingestion of credit card numbers. So there's credit card number detectors everywhere because people will put credit card numbers in fields they're not supposed to put them in. So you have this constant danger of ingestion of um, quite serious private information. Uh, and here's vehicle one involved, vehicle two involves, it says motor car. And uh, that's quite hard to work out, but I think it's saying light goods vehicle, LGW. Okay, so it's nice that we think neural networks are gonna fix all this, but they're clearly not. Like for no time soon, will they be able to do all the things we're just looking at there? Because you've got to do a load of contextual information about, oh, is that likely to be light goods vehicle? Because it, says, it seems to say UGW. Anyway, I went for light goods vehicle, but... So that's all, oh yeah, okay, so that was another one I got. Yeah, good luck with that one. You know, 
trying to work out what on earth's going on there. So someone's obviously written across the whole field there, not stuck to the columns. So that's quite hard to deal with. So this seems like one of the hardest parts to automate, right? But um, in some sense, the automation of that process is going on in the background. That's the driving force. This so-called digital transformation we're all experiencing is what's driving the need for data science. So it is ongoing. And one of the annoying things is that you can spend ages trying to collect such data, but as soon as something is digitally automated, the amount of data you will get is orders of magnitude higher than everything you've collected in the past. So you see that in health data, right, where everyone's trying to go through old doctor's handwritten notes and letters to extract health information. But as soon as things become digitized and there's electronic health records, you're getting far more uh, a greater wealth of information than you can ever get by going back and trying to digitize the analog records. But there's still some cases where you want, will want to do it, like um, historical records of temperature. So assess is only the things you can do without knowing the inverted commas question. And the whole point is to ensure that this is reusable across tasks. Um, and this whole notion is driven by this big phenomenon of happenstance data. And I would associate it with data readiness level B mainly, but you know, it's in your head is what is this, is this task I'm doing now? Is it an access task or is it an assess task? I want you to separate that. And I'll show you how you're gonna separate it, a proposed way of separating it at the end. So we've got a quick case study on that. This is uh, Joyce's project. Um, Text mining for COVID misinformation. So this is a project that she got sponsored by Data Science Africa to try and look at what the misinformation situation is going on in uh, Uganda around where COVID is, what's going on with vaccination misinformation. You know, it's funny today, there's more and more stuff in the press about Facebook's ability to um, track misinformation on their platform uh, in English. How well do you think they are doing in Aramaic or Bugandan or any other language that is being used. And you know, it basically seems the answer is they're just not. So this is a very serious problem because these are far less stable um, democracies with far fewer institutions to try and regulate that form of misinformation. So Joyce here is working on that. So she's trying to look at Twitter. And in this case, there's, there's a whole load of sort of work that you could imagine as assessed. So she can get that data from the Twitter API but then imagine all the things she's going to try and do to that data to try and extract information. So some of the things in the, oh, this, so this is just some information about where the usage is. So this is a usage of Facebook in um, uh, Uganda. So this is the percentage of people that use Facebook. You can see amongst the sort of generation 18 to 34 who are going to be perhaps quite significant. I mean, in, in this type of thing, it's, it's very widely used. Um, so yeah, that's 3 million Facebook users in Uganda. That's a population of, I think, so I think it's, a, it's roughly six or 7 million total population. So that's quite high. So trying to find that information, very, very important. But there's any, hardly any low resource languages considered when detecting misinformation in COVID-19. The other problem that Joyce has is that there's hardly any tools for select for detecting things like intent and word detection for low resource languages like Ugandan or Ugandan English as well. So this comes a lot. So develop a text mining model, to track misinformation, understand perceptions related to Ugandan government's COVID-19 transmission mitigation strategies from social media data. Almost everything she ends up doing therefore is somewhat assessed, but within assess, she's doing modeling herself because she's building intent models as well. Right, so she's ending up doing, okay, I need an intent model. That model's not appropriate. I need to do some work here. It's all assessing the data though, in some sense, because, okay, we do know a broad question. So this is where the barriers fall down a little bit, right? But she's just gonna build a, a dashboard at the end of it that's going to try and present this data. So in, to a large extent, a lot of the work that's going on here is assess. So the Luganda language, most widely spoken indigenous language in Uganda, around 7 million, and first and second language speakers so that's like the whole country is low resource so what we mean by low resource is that we don't have a lot of um uh, resources in terms of i think it, it tends to mean it's it, okay it's probably a function of money but it's like there aren't resources in terms of labeled data sets and etc cetera, etc cetera, for doing translation so you'll find you won't see like a google translation on ugandan um 
but then everyone's on the internet, internet enabled phones, and there's lots of posting in Luganda or also mixed posting. So where I'm um, code mixing, they call it, where people are switching between languages. So imagine all the sort of work around that. So I'm not gonna go too much into that. There's more written about it in the, um, in the uh, notes, but I want to, oh, so topic modeling is, is a classic sort of thing that you might be interested in doing in that space to try and find out what uh, different topics are. So look, you can see the influence of NTV is um, one of the major news stations. And you can see all these sort of things that people are talking about in these articles about COVID. Okay, so I'm gonna skip through that just cause I wanna to get to this. Ah, right, so just to sort of say another video for you, this is Chris Williams, who was a old friend and colleague who's at the University of Edinburgh. He's talking about the AI for Data Analytics project where they're trying to look at some of the issues around how you process data and how can you use machine learning for helping in tidying up this data. So it's sort of using machine learning um, for uh, improving uh, data wrangling. And that's a really interesting talk there. So things like data diff, you've noticed that a data set has changed doing diff on data sets. Okay, so finally address, this is where we address the question. This is like the thing that you were being taught the whole time, either in statistics or machine learning. Here's your data, fit a model, do the answer, right? There's often, it is the case that when you're addressing the question, you will also need more annotation. So just like in those other frameworks, you've got these cycles of needing to go back to acquire more data or realize that you need to annotate something. But it's not only machine learning modeling. So confirmatory data analysis is what it would be called in statistics. So sort of demonstrating, getting down to the point where you can actually answer a statistical question. Visualization through a dashboard is probably the most common people think, thing people are asking for. But another thing, and this was like really common in Amazon, is you had to push your result into an Excel spreadsheet that the manager could then play with, right? So it's all coming from SQL, it's all going through these processing, but then it's pushed into an Excel template that the manager can then work with and sort of ask their own questions of the data. Um, and this is mainly associated with data read in this level A. Okay, so there's some talks about uh, how to automate machine learning there. That, so I'm, sort of, I'm constantly interested in how does one automate this? Because the question, how does one automate this shows you some of the difficulties. Okay, so how are you going to go around about doing this? So then the final thing I'm going to introduce you to is the finesse template. So what I'm suggesting you do for your assignment is that you um, build your own repo. You don't have to use GitHub. You can just recreate the template somewhere else, but build your own repo using this template. So what I've done, so as it says here, it's a repo for doing data analysis according to the finesse framework. And let's just uh, um, stop. No, oh, I do that one. So let's go to the GitHub. Let's see if I come up. So you don't have to, I wouldn't call your module finesse but the idea is this is a template for a python module that you would use for analysis so this will this template will currently pip install but there's no software there so you can see there's a setup py file for pip installing so the idea is like the first thing that your notebook does is you pip install <coughs> your library that you're using for analysis but as you go into the library it's separated into these different parts right so access, for example, and it sort of says at the top, it's hoping to remind you, look, this is the sort of thing you might end up using in, in, in your um, library. Um, you know, here for you, it'd be like, here be something to accessing MariaDB for your assignment, things like this. And, and that, you know, my, my sense is when you code, if you're anything like me, and you're probably somewhat like me, um, there are certain, things that make you realize, oh, I'm doing something wrong. Like if you're copying and pasting codes to places, you think, okay, maybe there's something wrong with my structure. Maybe I need to refactor. And I was wondering about what the equivalent is when I code in data science. And it's often like, oh, which library am I importing? If I'm, if I'm importing an authentication library, that doesn't feel like assess. If I'm using an authentication library, maybe that's a clue that this is an access 
term. So what, I, what this library is set up to do is once you've imported that, you've got your library dot access dot access dot address, right? And so it's becoming very clear your notebook is going to include calls to that library. So you might start writing the code in the notebook. That's certainly how I do it. And then it gets to a certain point. I'm like, oh, right, this is, this is a function. This functionality needs to be moved into the library and it ends up being replaced. Like the, the pods.datasets.endmiss, right? You, you'll see them all in the notebook, right? So at one point they would have been something I'd have written in the notebook. And then I'm like, I'm using this all the time. I'm pushing it into the library. And you'll see pods has got an access subdirectory because it's all about data access, right? To try and make it look like I've always used this framework, even though it's only a recent thing that I realized that is a good idea. So you'll sort of see that there. And then assess similarly. So pandas, Boca, Boca is a visualization framework. Um, Matplotlib plot. I mean, there's other things. So uh, stats models probably comes in here as well. It's definitely not a clean separation. But you just want to be able to justify why you're doing it and be thinking about it, right? It's all about that. Will someone else be able to reuse this? Because if so, it's got to be an assess or access. And then you can imagine, then it's possible to port that out. Someone else can take that and import that themselves, right? Or it becomes absorbed into the ecosystem of the wider code base. I'll stop there because it's five two, and I was, I was hoping to ask, have a few questions, but I went a little bit longer than I expected. Um, let me stop sharing and just see if there's a very quick question.